Hi, I'm Spencer Taggart, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about my Lifey. What a cool program that Alex has put together, and I appreciate the opportunity to share my life's history. This is powerful. Hopefully my kids and grandkids and great-great-grandkids will be able to understand a little bit more about who I am, where I came from, what I'm passionate about, and, you know, what I've learned. Maybe share some nuggets of wisdom so that they don't have to learn the hard way as I have. I was born in 1980, and I was the oldest of six kids, and so obviously they weren't born yet. But I was born in Salt Lake, and then about when I was one year old, we moved up to Park City, Utah, and it was incredible. My parents, my dad moved up there to build a spec home, meaning he built it, and the minute we moved in, he put it up for sale, and seven years later, he still hadn't sold it. And so that was really where my childhood happened until I was eight and probably baptized. I shared a driveway with the Bradleys. Jake Bradley was like one of my, he was my best friend growing up. We shared a driveway and there was no one else around. It's interesting because you know how they, okay, this is cliche, but my kids walk to school now and I make them walk to school even when it's cold and it's a quick little walk. I lived way up in the mountains. It was a mile to my bus stop and I think it was something like like 20, no, like 1800 feet in elevation change. I mean, it's straight up a mountain to get from the bus stop to my house. I was five years old when I started going to kindergarten, and my parents made me walk to and from school. So imagine as a five-year-old leaving in Park City with a foot of snow on the ground, maybe two or three feet of snow on the ground. It's pitch black. And... I'm walking to the bus stop with little Jake Bradley and I, two little kindergartners. Dogs are chasing us. I mean, it was, it was crazy. And, but that's how I've done it. I walked to the bus everywhere my parents moved after that. I had over, well, not over, but around a mile uh, walk to the bus stop. And... Some of those winter mornings when it's 20 below zero and there's three feet of snow on the ground and, you know, you're trying to get to early morning seminary and it's like, please, mom, at least give me a ride today. I think my mom would have more often than my dad. But yeah, after Pinebrook, we moved uh, into a little condo while we built the next spec home. We moved up into Hidden Cove. It's kind of a behind Jeremy Ranch and uh, moved up there. Super long walk to the bus stop as well. There's always moose and porcupine and deer. And another one of my best friends there was Chad Bauman. And first broken, first broken bone, fallen out of a tree house that we built up in the woods. Uh, I always had a best friend where I lived growing up. And so I'm grateful that my parents, they always moved out into kind of the new growth areas of Park City, built a spec home and ended up not selling it for two or three or four years sometimes. But we moved a lot when I was a kid. I think we moved before I left on my mission 11 times as a child. We lived in every single ward in Park City. Uh, a lot of little condos while we were building new houses. And one of the big moves was to the Philippines and back, and I'll talk about that later. But I had, I had an incredible childhood. So many great friends, so many great memories, so much fun. And it, it was awesome. So mom, mom and dad, Paul and Jane, Paul Taggart and Jane Driggs, now Taggart, Thanks for an incredible childhood. A little bit about my high school. I went to Park City High School and I graduated in 1998 and loved it. 
had way more fun than I studied, that's for sure. I was not the best student. I think I just didn't care. I was way more into the social scene, and my parents would definitely not argue with that point. But I enjoyed high school. Loved seminary, graduated from seminary. I, I sang a lot. I tried a lot of different sports, basketball, or I guess I never made the basketball team. I don't know if I ever tried out, but football, track, uh, mostly singing, played a lot of golf, a lot of skiing, a lot of bowling, but mostly it was about fun and girls and dating and just having a blast with my buddies. Our house was kind of Grand Central Station. That's where we had most of the parties. We had campfires and we'd have sleepovers. Every time we had like a prom or a big dance, we'd typically sleep over at our house, everybody. A lot of that had to do with the fact that I wasn't allowed to sleep over at somebody else's house. So we just always slept over at my house and had a great group of friends. Holy mackerel, they were awesome. Probably half LDS, half not LDS and they're still some of my best friends to this day. And uh, let's see, high school. Graduated probably lower half of my class. Uh, I was pretty lazy. I always worked. I always had a job. I was a waiter, not a waiter, but a busboy at Grappa, Cicero's, and Adolph's. Uh, I got in a lot of car accidents. I had 14 speeding traffic tickets before my mission. And I was really good at talking my way out of tickets, and therefore it's amazing that I had 14 because I probably got out of about 90. Um, what else? High school. Tons of fun. I dated a couple of girls, had a, had a wonderful romantic time with some fun, awesome girls that I still appreciate. And... and uh, after high school, I, I went down to Snow College because of a girl I was dating, Kim. And, but after a few months, it, it was not good. So I dropped out of college and moved to Minnesota with my uncle Steve and Amy Driggs. And I worked with him at an ad agency called Fallon McGilligan. It was huge. So here's a funny story about Fallon, okay? Uh, I was this, you know... 18 year old kid had a huge afro and you know I'm the new kid and so at the Christmas party that year they have this 20 piece band just playing swing music and at Snow College I had just taken half of a a swing class and so nobody was dancing and I'm tr I'm just out there dancing all crazy and just having fun and everybody's watching me and the whole company is a huge company and so I, uh, I'm dancing crazy, and all of a sudden this woman in this has this big boa, like those feather things. I turn around, and she's there, and she's like, okay, let's dance. And we do this awesome swing dance, and, and I was twirling her and spinning her and lifting her and all fun. I mean, just hilarious. And then after that, everybody comes out and dances. And I go sit down, and my boss at the time was like, you are nuts what are you doing? And I was like, what? He's like, you realize that is Pat Fallon's wife. And it was like, oh, wow, that's the owner of this massive agency's wife. But then they came over and it was like, hey, if you ever want a job here, come back anytime. Because I was leaving, you know, a few weeks later to go back and and uh, actually take a trip to the Philippines and start again at the University of Utah. So I went to the Philippines just by myself. We had served a family mission, and I'll talk about that later there, and I wanted to go back and visit some friends, and I wanted to go back to college, and so I went to the University of Utah starting in January and did Sigma Chi. I didn't quite make it all the way through Sigma Chi. I did all the the pledge stuff, all the nasty stuff, but I felt the Spirit just tell me this is not what you're supposed to do. Uh, so I didn't ever go through the initiation or the, the I can't remember what it's called, but becoming a Sigma Chi. And finished that semester of college, which was a complete waste. I only took nine credits 
and I think I got like C's and so when I got back from my mission I had to retake those classes. And after, after the U, I was kind of just waiting for my mission, you know, just I got my call right around the time that I finished that semester and I wasn't, that was May 10th and I wasn't leaving till August 25th. So I kind of had a, had a long just waiting period and I was super lazy. I had broken up with Kim. I also felt very inspired that she wasn't supposed to be my wife. And so I wanted to break that off before my mission and uh, crazy started dating another girl before my mission and she sent me off and she, she got she started dating somebody pretty quick after that and anyway uh, my mom so a few months before my mission my mom finally just kicked me out of the house because I was lazy and I didn't I wasn't contributing I think I slept in probably till one in the afternoon and I had no drive to do anything. And she kicked me out and she said, don't come back until you have a job. And I went and got a job with prepaid legal services. I, I didn't realize it was like a network marketing company. But this, this, you know, German or Russian, not Russian, but maybe, I don't know, probably German, Reinhard Staminger. He'd probably be angry if I said he was German, but Maybe he was Norwegian or something. Anyway, he hired me, uh, even though I had to pay to be his employee. <laughs> I used the last, you know, hundred and two hundred and fifty dollars in my bank account to become a a distributor of prepaid legal, and luckily it it lit a fire under me. You know, I kind of got the entrepreneurial spirit and just started crushing it quickly became like the fastest executive director in the company. I started making really good money. I recruited a whole sales team of like 115 people before I left on my mission. And so I was on fire. It was funny. I went from one extreme to the other where I was so lazy, no motivation to, I was working, you know, sometimes 20 hours a day and my mom's like, why are you working so hard? Like, enjoy before your mission. Pretty extremes. I'm kind of an extreme person, but I dove right in and, and thought that I was going to be a millionaire when I got home from my mission, but uh, it didn't happen that way. So that is kind of the, the story of my upbringing. I'm sure there's hundreds of wonderful stories and examples that I could talk about, but that in a nutshell is how... I got prepared on my to serve a mission. I don't know if that even made any sense, but normal childhood, high school, had a blast, kind of dinked around until I was 19 and could go on a mission. And luckily, I, I learned how to work right before my mission. Let's talk a little bit about my education. So after high school, uh, I went to Snow College for half a semester, dropped out. Then I went to the University of Utah for one semester, took nine credits, and got C's. After my mission, I came back and went to UVU, uh, Utah Valley University, for one semester. And I think I got like 31 credits because I did this Spanish thing and I took 15 credits. and. Awesome. Like that was huge. I did much, much better after the mission. And while right before I started at UVU, I actually met my wife and she lit a fire under me about the importance of education. But when I went to UVU, she was at London doing study abroad for BYU. And uh, she was a University of Utah student, but did BYU study abroad. When she got back, I went to the University of Utah with her and there was no, like with Katie, she is a maximizer. And so she's an achiever, maximizer, like activator. I mean, she's, she's amazing. Arranger. So she helped me arrange my schedule. She maximized my time. And she made me achieve so much more than I ever thought I was capable of in school. So that fall, uh, we had now been dating for about six months and... I started at the University of Utah and I had to get permission 
uh, because if you take more than 18 credits, you have to get permission from like the dean or something. And I, I think I took, ooh, excuse me, I think I took about 20 credits that semester. Yeah, I'm getting tired just thinking about it. And I got a job uh, trying to do prepaid legal still and trying to do some network marketing stuff that was just stupid. And so I dove into school, but uh, took 20 credits that semester. We got engaged at the end of that semester. Totally another story that I'll, I'll share for sure. And the next semester, I think I took 20, 21 or 22 credits. And then that next summer, we got married, but I think I took 12 credits that semester. The la And that summer, I also got a job at Wells Fargo because once we got married, we needed some, you know, some benefits and she wanted me to have a real job. And she, she's totally guided my entire life. She's amazing. And after that, I took 20... Woo. So now I'm working at the bank 30 hours a week. That semester I took 24 credits and it was amazing. Like when you're, when you're taking 24 credits and you're working 30 hours at the bank, you just don't have time to be lazy. You don't have time to waste. You've got to dive into your life and just crush it every moment. And that last semester I took maybe maybe 22 credits and graduated. And so I really went, oh, and I had to retake those nine credits that I had taken before my mission. And so I graduated in about, about two years, thanks to the Spanish stuff at UVU and then my wife just making me bust it. But I got a four-year degree in about two years and I'm so grateful because after that I worked, well, okay, the career will be a whole nother chapter of my life. -y. So on the vein of education, I didn't think I'd ever go back to school. I always wanted to be like wildly successful, but I didn't think education was going to get me there. I always thought that I'd start a business and just blow up and somehow be a billionaire. And I hadn't kind of thought through what that would take. But luckily, after Wells Fargo, um, and after Taggart Land and some other things, Katie and I felt really inspired to get as much education as we could. And so we went to Thunderbird. And that in and of itself is a pretty powerful story of how we got into Thunderbird. And I'd like to actually reference another YouTube video that in my lifey, you can see a link to the story of Joe Troncoso and the power of integrity helping me get into Thunderbird. And what a blessing it was that Heavenly Father uh, allowed us to go there. Thunderbird was the number one international business school for like 20 years in a row at the time. Wonderful school. Sorry, I keep yawning. Man, thinking about all this education, I'm like going all in. But anyway, Thunderbird, okay? Great school, lots of international students, so much fun. But funny enough, my favorite part about Thunderbird was our band. We, uh, I think it was the first semester, Charlie McDonald, he's my best friend from Thunderbird. He's an Australian. And he and I were invited to join this, this like gala, this fundraiser kind of type gala. And Global Sounds was the, was the club, kind of the, the Thunderbird band. And so we're like, oh, I don't know, it sounds kind of cheesy, but I'm a singer and he was a guitar player and that's what they needed. And so we're like, okay, we'll do it. And it was amazing. Like it was so much fun. He is so talented. And there were other people in the band that were so good. And so we decided, let's just dive into Global Sounds. And we had this band that had, so the other backup singer and lead singer, Fernanda, she was from Mexico. We had our bass player, Julien, from France. We had uh, a sax player from Brazil, another couple of guitar players from the South, Ben, my man. He was, he was a Southern dude just jamming on the guitar. 
we had a couple of different drummers. Scott and Nick were two different drummers that would go back and forth. Uh, our trumpet player, also Ben Korsmo, jeez, he played the trumpet in like in the army. He'd be the one playing the Star Spangled Banner for the president type stuff. Um, just an incredible, diverse group of people that came together to make music, and it was so fun. Pam Zaff was one of my absolute best friends uh, from Thunderbird. Tommy, oh, Tommy! I love so many people down there, and to this day, they're, they're such close friends, and I love them. But the greatest thing about Thunderbird is it taught me how to think. It taught me you know, really how to, how to look, at a, look at a problem and figure out how to solve it. And so I'm so grateful for that chapter in my life. Like the relationships and knowledge that I gained at Thunderbird are, how do you put a price tag on it? Yeah, it was really expensive, but I'm so grateful for that experience. And it enabled me to get the job that really changed my life, which was being a faculty member at LDS Business College and writing a degree in social media marketing. You know, as such a poor student in high school, uh, having, I'm sure I had several learning disabilities. And, you know, when I was in third grade, I still didn't know how to read. My peers, my third grade other students, I remember Chad Crowther had to try and teach me and coach me how to read. And now, you know, fast forward, I don't know, 30 years, and I'm writing an entire degree that now hundreds of students have graduated from this degree, and it became kind of the fastest growing degree, which, okay, I'm getting into the career side of things, but it's it's aligned with education. And so the education that I've had, I'm so grateful for. But one thing that I want to say about education is don't think about education as traditional education. I truly believe that the world of education is changing so much. What's important about education is the learning and the skills that you gain. Because in your career, in your life, people want to know what value can you add? How can you bring value to to my work or how can you bring value to my life? And not the only way that you learn is through traditional education. A lot of traditional education is actually flawed these days because it's such old learning. It's an old learning style, and it doesn't actually prepare you for the world of work. And so don't ever feel like you have to get a traditional education, but never stop learning. Learning, trying new things, experiencing things, like this whole studio right here. I bet Alex doesn't have a degree in film and YouTube and photography and social media and adding value to people's lives, but he's now through hundreds and hundreds of videos gained a lot of experience that makes him incredibly valuable. So that's my shtick about education. I I love learning and I will hopefully never stop learning. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about my career to this point, and it's been quite a journey. You know, I've always been an entrepreneur. I never thought that I'd work for somebody, but I do. And I think I work for the best company organization on the planet, which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I've worked there now for about four years in a couple of different capacities. But let me tell you the journey of how I got to that that place in my career. So as a young kid, I always sold, you know, cakes and brownies and golf balls and lemonade and little crocheted little bags or sewing bags that I would sell door to door or sell at the golf course at Jeremy Ranch up in Park City and always had that that in me. I always loved business and I'm sure I got that from my dad and my mom. I think almost all my mom's brothers are entrepreneurs and my dad's an entrepreneur, and so it's it's definitely in my blood. But uh, as a kid, I always worked at restaurants, or I always I worked at the outlet malls. I worked at Walmart as a greeter. I worked at my dad's developments, like cleaning and sweeping and framing. I remember six my sixteen summer of sixteen. I I framed houses up in Park City. I've had so many different jobs, 
And after my mission, prepaid legal, I tried the network marketing stuff, but that was, that was not good. You have to become that, and that's not who I am. And so I learned very early on that I would not be doing network marketing. Um, not the right thing for me. But I loved working at Wells Fargo. That was really fun. I became the number one teller in the nation after about a week, which was cool. I always had a knack for sales, and that came from my dad too. He, we were golfing one day really young, and I asked him like, Dad, or he asked me, he said, Spence, what do you think makes the world run? And my initial answer was money. And he said, no, no, it's not money, it's people. If you can make, if you can make, like, if you can figure out how to work with people, one day you can rule the world. And as like a 10 year old, that changed my life. I thought, I have got to figure out how to work well with people. And so I've always been in jobs where I'm working with people. And after Wells Fargo, I got invited to go down and start Taggart Land uh, with my dad as a partner and with this guy, John Quittiquit, as kind of the money guy. And he was, a, he was brilliant. He taught me kind of how to do land, and then my dad taught me how to do land. And we had a lot of fun. And that set, set us up for, for a lot. It was, a, it was really neat. Katie and I and my dad ran the company. Then we tried this stinking company called Fat Bottom Line, and that was a disaster, a train wreck. We all lost a lot of money. My dad lost by far the most and set him in motion to, to really have to rediscover like what he was going to be when he grew up. And yet he had a two-year-old at the time and a lot of debt and huge life journey that you'll have to hear from my dad. But, but what was amazing is his example of faith. He, he never lost faith. In fact, it strengthened his faith. And I believe it allowed him to prove to Heavenly Father that, hey, I, I'm in it for you, Heavenly Father, and I will, I will obey you and do what you want me to do. And therefore, Heavenly Father blessed him with another company that, that allowed him to go serve and, and really do what he loves the most the rest of his life. Well, during that same time, after Fat Bottom Line failed miserably and the land market totally bubbled and lost Taggart land, uh, that's when I went back to school, the Thunderbird, and I've talked about that in an early part of my lifey. And after Thunderbird, I went and worked for a company called Struck. There's a, another reference that I want to point to another video in my lifey, so go check out like understanding how to ask Heavenly Father uh, questions of prayer and it's cool how I got to struck and the, the, the help that Heavenly Father gave in answering that question for us to both Katie and I. Struck was an agency, a marketing agency. I worked there and social media was just coming into the world and, and it, I learned a lot about strategy and design and creative and, and new business and I was like the new business guy there. And then I went and worked for Blendtec, a blender company and I was kind of in charge of marketing and social media and stuff like that. A lot of fun. Learned a ton. Worked with awesome people like Tom Dixon and, and met some really neat friends and just had a blast at Blendtec, a blender company. Who knew? So fun. After that, I, I worked at kind of a think tank. It was like a startup think tank lab. And that's where I really learned a ton about marketing and strategy and social media from so many brilliant people. Lad Christensen, genius. Mark Webb and Matt uh, Bradley, amazing, brilliant strategists. And changed my life. I, I really learned how to think there. In addition to Thunderbird, that's, that was my university. That was such a collaborative effort to figure out how to, how to use strategy with many of the most brilliant minds in the Western United States when it comes to marketing and strategy and social media. But that was burnt to the ground. It was crazy. That ended up uh, getting dissolved as an organization 
And so I went through a six month period where I didn't have a job and it was really, really difficult for Katie because she, she was able to learn a lot about what faith is. And it was different because she and I had to learn very different lessons during that six months of, of unemployment. But luckily we had some savings and so from Taggart Land and we were able to live uh, comfortably. And, but during that six months, it was a huge paradigm shift for me. I was able to kind of say, Heavenly Father, what do you want me to do? Because prior to that in my career, I always was chasing money and it was a part of my being. But anyway, back to my paradigm shift in my life, I think Heavenly Father needed me to take enough time to identify really what made Katie and I happy. What were those basic things? Like in the temple, it talks about having sufficient for our needs. And what did that mean for Katie and I? And we had to get really small to understand very, very intimately what are the small things that make us happy. And we came up with four things. For me, it was really only one. I had to do something that I'm extremely passionate about and believe in. For her, she needed insurance. We needed to make enough money to be able to pay for piano lessons without worrying about it. And we kind of came up with a number for that. And then the third is we needed enough time to go on vacation. We wanted to be able to go on at least a couple vacations a year. And so once we figured that out, we went through about six months of, of discovering that and discovering that, that we wanted to do something for me that I could really believe in. And so that finally, once, once we defined it, Heavenly Father opened the door at LDS Business College through a really neat experience in the temple where, where I felt inspired to talk to a certain man and I was able to connect with him kind of through, through the internet a couple of days later. Didn't know who he was in the temple, but I figured it out and met with him and they were looking for somebody to write the degree in social media marketing and launch that at LDS Business College. And so they invited me to come and be a faculty member at LDSBC. And I was able to interview with a, with a first quorum of the 70, Elder David Evans, who was also over the missionary department. And ironically, two weeks later after that, uh, my dad was called to be a mission president. So that, that was definitely an inspired kind of God wink, as my friend Art Smith would say. And I got the job and it changed my life. I, I was able to work in an environment where we prayed before every, me, every meeting. We, we sought the guidance of Heavenly Father and I got to teach, which is probably one of my favorite things of all time to do. And so I wrote a degree in social media marketing using the strategy and the, the things that I had learned in school, at Strzok, at Blendtec, and especially at this think tank with some of my really, really close friends. And it was incredible. But working for an, an institution owned by the LDS Church, where I got to teach young people about who they are, I got to teach strategy for the most part, I learned way more about strategy than, than anyone I taught. And I know that by teaching, you always learn the most. And the Spirit was able to teach and solidify in my heart like this, this strategic framework that we had developed. And I was able to simplify it with Heavenly Father's help. And now I use it in pretty much every decision that I make. And other people do as well. And so that launched me into, a, into kind of a platform for my career to really excel. I was able to start speaking a lot which I love. I was able to organize a couple of events called L2E and P2B, where I got to inspire tons of people to discover their life's mission and learn how to tell their story in life. It was incredible. I'm just so grateful for that experience. I've got another video that I'll point you to that talks about some of the lessons that I learned at LDS Business College. Please check in those references at in my lifey. Uh, but awesome. And just recently I left LDS Business College because I felt inspired to 
to go work at Bonneville Communications or Boncom, and we get to spread light and truth to the world. We get to help with some of the missionary efforts of the church in telling those stories and using beautifully in influential people and spreading the gospel and spreading great messages around the world. And Heavenly Father, once, once I kind of defined what I wanted to do, and once I defined my personal vision, which is inspire all to know and share God's love, He opened those doors to allow me to do that more than I could ever have imagined. So it's beautiful. Uh, the piano guys actually turned us on to this quote. Ezra Taft Benson said that men and women who turn their lives over to God will find that he can do a lot more with it than they can. The piano guy said that. It's like when we turn our lives over to God, he will open opportunities and doors that you could have never imagined. You just have to let him do it. And that's how it's been with my career. Heavenly Father has guided every step. And I'm so grateful that I'm not some lazy billionaire or what I wanted to be at age 25 because of the things that I've learned and the lives that I've touched and the man that it has helped me become. About one month after my mission, I met Katie Thorne. Oh my goodness, she was a fireball. And it was funny because when I got home, one of my cousins, Molly Diamond, she was a sorority girl at Chi Omega. And I got home and it was like, wow, my cousin's in a sorority? Jackpot. And I called her. I'm like, can you please line me up with one of your friends? And, and Molly thought, the only person that can handle Spence is Katie. And so she lined us up and we went on a double date with one of my other mission companions and one of Katie's sorority sisters. And it was a train wreck. The first part of the date was pretty fun, but we came home and we played this stupid game that I just, I was trying to be cocky and Anyway, I kind of got all my cards out on the table, all of my stupidity and, and dumb things about me. And Katie's looking at me like, who is this nincompoop? Like, why would I ever want to be with this, this loser? And uh, anyway, luckily, I really liked her. And so I wanted to take her out again. And I think my cousin warning me like, oh, she's she's got a serious boyfriend on a mission. She's, you know, she's not your type, Spence, but no one else could handle your, your craziness. And so that's why I lined you up. I think I might have taken it as a challenge. Like, I'm going to see if I can make this girl like me. So I asked her out again, and I took her on the most elaborate date, okay? We went... I mean, it was like the marathon date. I, I picked her up with my sister, Abby. We went and got ice cream. We went to Abby's performance or dance performance. And then I took her out to Benihana. And then we were going to go to a movie, but we had some time to kill. So I took her bowling. Then I think we went like dancing for a half an hour. <laughs> then we went to the movie. And it was so funny because we smelled like Benihana. We went into the wrong movie theater because two movies were playing that time. It was the right movie, just the wrong time. So we walk in like middle of the movie. I make a big scene with all her friends happen to be in that movie. And I think we got home at like one in the morning and I was exhausted. And I'm like, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? And she's like, oh, I'm going skiing with a bunch of friends. And I just totally invited myself. She's like, I can't get rid of this guy. I'm like, oh, I'll meet you up there. And so she and I just ended up going skiing together at Snowbird. And I had been trying to kiss her like all day on the, on the, you know, on the chair lifts and stuff. And I'd, we'd bump into each other's goggles and just, oh, it was so sweet. And in my mind, I'm thinking, this girl is amazing. And in her mind, she's thinking, you know, I'm leaving for London in a couple of weeks. Like I've never had a fling in my life. Maybe I'll just have a fling with this kid because why not? You know, no harm in that. But Heavenly Father had a different plan. Anyway, later while we're skiing, uh, we go off into the woods and I finally end up kissing her. And I said something that I had said to her other sorority sister that I had kissed only about a week 
earlier, I said the same line to her about like how amazing her bottom lip is. And Katie just let me have it. She, she was like, you are disgusting. Like you have no respect for women. And she just, she drilled me for like 20 minutes. She couldn't wait to get away from me. She was disgusted. And I was in love. I was like, oh yes, like this is the woman that I need to keep me in line. That was literally the moment that I fell madly in love with Katie Thorne because I knew I needed somebody to put me in my place. And so anyway, luckily I kind of, I won her back over and I apologized and, you know, sincerely apologized. And I think I slept on her couch or something and they're like, who is this crazy kid? But then we ended up hanging out almost every single day. And within a couple of weeks, we were so in love with each other. And sadly, she left for London like two weeks later, but, but we were so in love that we wrote all the time. And, you know, email was brand new. Katie set me up with my first email. I didn't know what that was. And so I would buy these these phone cards that were so expensive to call London and I'd have to call it like one or two in the morning and use these phone cards that were international calling and it was so good for our relationship because there was no, you know, it was all about the real relationship. It was all about communication and understanding what we're passionate about and so we didn't have to have the physical stuff get in the way because when you're dating that's kind of a big deal and when she got home it was so funny because after maybe two weeks of her being home, we were so together. My mom even planned a temple date. She like booked one in September because Katie got home maybe in end of April. Oh yeah, because April 20th is her birthday and that's when the semester ended for BYU. I flew out to London and picked her up and she and I traveled London together for a week. And so my mom booked a temple date, but... Katie was not ready to get married and her parents would not have been happy about that. Well, so fast forward all the way to, to December and finally I propose. And so that's the next story is the proposal. So this is the story of how I proposed to my now wife. We had been dating exactly a year and I wanted to do something elaborate and so it was finals week and I had bought the ring, I had custom designed it. I was I was just flipping out because it's amazing when you pay for the ring, something just clicks and you're like, "Oh, this is this is like the real deal." But then when you pick up the ring, it even goes deep and you're like, "This is my wife's engagement ring. Like we're going to get married." And so I am so excited. I planned this whole trip to go to the coast of Oregon and we we're going to stay at this lighthouse keeper's cabin. I always had this dream of proposing on a, on a cliff in Oregon and having this big fake diamond ring. And when I knelt down to propose, I was going to trip and just throw the ring off the cliff and just be like, oh, and just freak her out. But I, I didn't want to do that but I still wanted to go to the coast of Oregon and propose at sunset. And, and so I found the most beautiful place that I've, I had ever seen, but I needed to ask permission from her parents. And so she was going to be down in Provo one day. And, and so I schedule it with her mom and dad. And I, you know, I had known them. We'd dated for a year and I thought for sure they knew this was coming. I thought they'd be open arms like, oh, welcome to the family. And I write this beautiful poem. We sit down and I read the poem and it's like, I'd love permission, your, your permission and your blessing to marry your daughter. And I just get this blank, you've got to be kidding me. Like, there's no way you can marry our daughter. Like, you don't even have a plan. You don't even know you don't have a master's degree. What job do you want? Like Kent and Joanna were, they thought I was crazy to think that I would be prepared to get married. 
And so we had a, we had a pretty, uh, pretty heated discussion. I was trying all the things that I'd learned from Stephen R. Covey, but they weren't having it. They're like, you don't have a clue what you're doing in life. And they were totally right. I just thought, yeah, I'll just, you know, make some relationships and make a lot of money. And I, I didn't have a plan. I didn't have anything. And so, so we kind of agreed, okay. And we had a temple date set and everything. And so I talked to him about dates. And so we agreed, okay, we won't, we'll cancel that date. We'll push it out to some date in the future. And I'll try and get a plan set. Okay, I'll try and get a plan in my life. So they're probably thinking, yeah, he'll come back in a couple of years, you know, once he gets some plans drawn out. But three days, I had already got the ring. I'd already planned this whole trip to engage. So I went back and I, I created like these, these posters, these color coordinated charts of a, I built this five year timeline of our lives. I had another poster that was all the finances of marriage and how I was going to support Katie. And anyway, Kent and Joanna both softened up and they were like, okay, fine, you can marry her. And I don't think they were super happy about it, but they were, they were great. And so Katie didn't know about the trip to Oregon. I pick her up, I packed her bags, we get in the car and we go to Oregon and it was amazing. I had written her a song. I had all these roses. I had to speed because we had to get there by sunset. I mean, we're on these cliffs just looking out over this lighthouse. It was beautiful. And I had written a poem and just knelt down and asked her if, just thinking about it, it's like, wow, what a, what a pivotal moment in our eternal lives. Just thinking, I can see it all in my mind. It's a forested area. It is so gorgeous. And I got down on one knee and just asked her if she'd be my eternal companion and told her how much I love her and sang her a song that I wrote for her. And it was magical. It truly was magical. And so after that, I, I remember we went back into this town. I think it was the town of Newport, Oregon. Um, I proposed at the, the Hasita Head Lighthouse just out of Newport, Oregon, where the sea lion caves are. It's a gorgeous lighthouse. And she called her dad and she's like, Dad, I'm engaged. And he's like, oh, my goodness, Katie, let me, uh, let me, let me see the ring. Come tell me the story. And she's like, well, Dad, I'm in Oregon. <laughs> He was like, what? <laughs> and uh, anyway, it was great. We, we came back and just had a six-month engagement. We did get, we pushed out the wedding date uh, for Kent and Joanna from May to, to June 23rd and got married. It was gorgeous. The, the wedding, holy moly. Kent and Joanna put on the wedding of the century. It was amazing. We, we did it in their backyard and they had like five different food stations where they had chefs cooking up different types of food. And we had this chocolate fountain and that was the first one we had ever seen. And, and we had Jeff Proctor in a live band and dancing and food. And it was gorgeous. So colorful. The cake was all kinds of colors. I mean, it was true Katie and Spence fashion with the Joanna touch of like elegance and grace. And we had a wedding dinner up at my house in Park City that the night before and singing and dancing. And it was magical. Our parents were so generous and so wonderful to throw such an elaborate celebration for our, our wedding. I was the oldest, but my sister Kelly had been uh, married before to my mission companion. Uh, Elder Lauren Brown, and they're amazing. So I'm going to end that. Uh, Katie and I got married, and it was amazing. We got engaged, and I couldn't be happier. I'm so much more in love with her now today than I was even then. And, and you're amazing. I love you, Katie. Best thing that ever happened to me. After Katie and I got married in Salt Lake at the Salt Lake Temple, we 
didn't have kids for four years, and so we had an adventure. Katie was working at Staff Care. I was working at Wells Fargo, and we were doing really well for a, for a young couple with no kids. We were renting an apartment in one of our best friend's basements, Lindsay and Vic Ream, and we were paying $375 a month for rent, which included all utilities, internet, everything. We we also, uh, so since she had a job, I was graduated, she was graduated, we were probably making about $80,000 a year combined and had no expenses. And so it was amazing. We were young, we had fun. We, we call it the Dink Kid, Double Income No Kids Club for four years. But we wanted to have an adventure, we wanted to travel. And so we, we quit our jobs and moved to California to start Taggart Land. And that'll be part of the career story. But, but during that time in California, we traveled the world. We, we got a boat with my dad and we boated a ton. We'd water ski. This was like crazy fun time, but it was also very challenging. Because Katie and I are such strong personalities and because we came from such different families, like you think about we relatively came from similar backgrounds. Okay, we both had LDS families. We both came from relatively affluent families who both loved us and cared for us and were amazing. But the culture in each of our families is very different. And so meshing those two cultures together and finding our own culture was kind of a battle. And Katie and I are both such strong personalities. Neither of us back down very often. And those first few years, although they were very blissful and very packed with so much adventure and fun, we had some, some tough growing pains, I think. And we are never not just madly in love with each other, but we fought quite a bit. And uh, luckily, Katie's rebound rate is like lightning fast. She'd be super mad because I'd do something stupid and Five minutes later, we'd just be madly in love again, which is awesome. Like, highly recommend that don't let things get you down for a long period of time. It's okay sometimes to disagree and fight, but but don't take it so personally and know that you love each other so much that you're willing to let it go and say sorry and get over things. And the other nice thing about Katie more than me is she was so willing to work on things. If I said, hey, will you please work on this? Bam, she would be all over working on it. And I struggled more with that. I wanted to work on things, but I'm just more prideful than she is. And so I was so lucky to have such an amazing, amazing wife. Katie and I traveled a lot. I think we went to about 28 different countries together. Uh, we've been kind of all over the world. We've been to Mexico, several different places in Mexico. We've been to Guatemala together. We've been to Peru and Machu Picchu and all over Peru. We've been to several countries in Europe. We've been to Egypt together, all over the United States. Well, we haven't been all over the United States together, but, but many places in the United States, probably 15, 16 states together. Uh, where else have we been, lover? During our marriage, I've been to Dubai. She didn't come to that. I mean, we're talking Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, for sure, you know, Paris or France and England and Germany and all the kind of main European countries that you'd want to go visit. We love travel. I think we love culture. We love experiencing different uh places, and I, that needs to be a staple in our lives. As we kind of matured in our, in our career later, we, we, that travel became one of our fundamental kind of non-negotiables in our lives is we need to be able to travel. It was such a neat time to bond together. It was such a neat time to let go of the rest of the world and be able to focus on our relationship and exploring and having an adventure. And it really helped. It was, it was awesome. 
And so we highly recommend doing that. Great four years. Uh, we did some business. We started a company together, Taggart Land, and uh, the good and the bad, you know, working with each other and fighting and loving and and growing and having kind of some financial success, but but also the the struggles of that is really interesting. So anyway, that's kind of our story before kids. So right now it is 4.42 in the afternoon, Thursday, March 30th, 2017. And we have a one-month-old boy named Soren West Taggart. We have a five-year-old little daughter named Presley T. Call Taggart. We have a seven-year-old daughter named Tally Joe Taggart and a nine-year-old boy named Lance Tripp Taggart. Those are our four kids. I don't think we're going to have any more. And Lance being our oldest, he was born right before Katie and I went to Thunderbird. He was actually born early. And here's a little tender mercy. Uh, he was born while I was supposed to be on a river rafting trip with my dad and brother. And my grandpa had paid for us to go on like this really cool river rafting trip down the Grand Canyon. And it was like, you know, five, five weeks before Katie was due. And so there was no real reason that I shouldn't have gone. But the Spirit said, no, you need to wait. Don't go on the trip because there was no cell phone service. There's no way I could have made it to my first son's birth. So I, I didn't go on the trip. And uh, Katie's water broke. We didn't even know it. I literally brought a huge cup full of amniotic fluid to the hospital to see if they needed a sample to see if it was amniotic fluid. I mean, Katie gushed. I guarantee it was like two gallons of, of fluid. It was insane. But Lance was born about five weeks early. He was five pounds, 10 ounces, so pretty good size for being early. And just the calmest, chillest, coolest kid in the world. So smart. We couldn't get a smile at him for the first year. I don't think he crawled for like 15 months. He was just chill to the bone. And to this day, he's, he's a chill kid. He's, he's very sensitive. He's very kind and loving and extremely intelligent. What a deep thinker. And I love him to death. He's my little goose. And he'll always be my, my best bud. I love you, Lance, and I'm so grateful for you. Tally Joe, oh, Joe after Joanna, Jojo, her, Katie's mom. And she is, she's perfection. She was the toughest of our children, like as a baby, but she is the sweetest, most faithful, loving child I've ever known. She always is thinking of others. Even at the age of two, she was always so concerned about others. And her testimony and faith in the gospel is rock solid. She's amazing. Little Presley, she is a, she's our little fireball. She's got so much confidence. She probably takes out after Katie the most. Just energy and confidence and pizzazz and wit. And she's just a gem. And Soren, he's only a month old, so I don't know. We don't know Soren yet, but he seems smart. He seems he's so easy and fun. And so those are our kids. And they have filled me and Katie's life with so much joy, I can't even explain it. They are truly the greatest of me and Katie's accomplishments and will always be the greatest thing in our lives. Other than our me and Katie's relationship, the kids are by far the best thing. Well, Heavenly Father and the gospel are close, but the reason that our kids are so good is you tie in the gospel with your children and teaching them the gospel and seeing them learn how to listen to the Spirit and pray and build their own little testimonies and ask the questions of, is Heavenly Father real? Like, was that really a miracle, Dad, that this dart, you know, got thrown through my skull and it didn't even hurt? my brain. There's so many neat things that happen where as a parent, 
you get to learn about patience and love and service. And I just feel inspired to sh say that I am so grateful for my wife. She is an incredible mother. She is always wanting to be better, and I, I love her. And our kids are so lucky to have her as their mom. Holy cow. I'd like to talk about my patriarchal blessing now and go back to some of my church service and missions in the church and, and end with my testimony. But as a 13-year-old boy, my family was called to go on a family mission to the Philippines. And at the time, there were only four of us. I was 13. My sister Kelly was probably 11. Abby was maybe eight and Sam was four-ish. And we moved to the Philippines and served a mission for, the year, for a year. After about two weeks, I was called to be the second counselor in the young men's presidency. And I didn't even know you could do that because I think I was a deacon at the time. And it was, it was life-changing. I was a stinker. I mean, I had a, I had a third-degree felony on my record for something stupid that I did. And the state almost didn't let us go out of the country because of my criminal record. I was a stinker. I mean, I always love people and I just love getting into trouble. But the Philippines changed my life. I started to realize how incredibly grateful I should be for what I had because I lived with people who lived off of the garbage. I lived with people who had nothing but were so happy. They were so just excited about life, even though they had nothing. They were so poor, and I was able to share the gospel with those people. We, my mom and, and the kids and I, we would go to orphanages and old folks' homes every single day and serve. We did homeschool. We, we served in the church. We served with the missionaries. We reactivated people at nights. And it changed our whole family's life, you know. It's interesting. One of the interesting things about the Philippines is that we thought that as a normal family, you know, we'd fight and we didn't really read scriptures that often. I mean, we always did, but not like intimately and deep. And we thought that as we left for the Philippines, we became full-time missionaries. We thought instantly everything would change and we would be this celestial family once we arrived in the Philippines. But when we got there, nothing really changed. We still fought. We were still lazy. We were still stinkers, super prideful. We didn't love reading the scriptures and all that kind of stuff. And so it, it was like, what? Why aren't we this perfect family? But we had to learn to become that. We had to learn to live with each other in tight little quarters and never be away from each other. You know, we... We had to learn a lot, and it was a gradual learning process. And so it's whenever I talk about moving on to the next life, I always assume that it's not like when we die, everything's going to be made perfectly clear and we're going to become Christ-like instantly. We're going to be the exact same people that we were here on earth, and just because we move on to the next stage doesn't mean that we're all of a sudden super different superpower people. It's going to be a process and a continual learning to, to become like our Heavenly Father. On, in the Philippines, we, one of the things that I loved is I got my patriarchal blessing there. I was 13 years old, and one of the area authority over there was a, was a patriarch, and he gave me my patriarchal blessing that has become a staple in my life. And what's interesting is some of the things that that my patriarchal blessing talks about are manifesting themselves today more than ever. It talks about the intensity with which I will give my testimony to so many people. And when I'm on stage at, at, a, at an event at LDS Business College or, or up at BYU-Idaho in front of a few thousand people testifying with all my heart right after I've got the crowd just like literally screaming and dancing on the stage like going crazy. What interesting words to be able to say, many will receive your testimony with the intensity with which you give. 
Every line of my patriarchal blessing is a guide to my life. It has been so spot on, and I'm so grateful for that blessing. You know, it, it truly is personal revelation and scripture for me, and I'm very grateful for it. I'd like to talk about my mission in Guatemala. And first of all, I'd like to reference there are seven or eight, I think eight different stories at the end of my life that talk about very spiritual moments in my mission. And so please reference those if you're interested in hearing about my mission, uh, because those are, the, those are eight spiritual, very faith-promoting, life-changing experiences that I've had. But my mission was life-changing. It, it helped me understand the gospel. It helped me understand uh, hard work, love, sacrifice, um, patience. It helped me understand how to speak Spanish. I still speak Spanish pretty consistently. I just taught a, a man the entire, all the discussions. I just confirmed him a member of the church all in Spanish just a couple weeks ago. And it was awesome. I'm so grateful that Heavenly Father has allowed me to keep my Spanish. And it's so much fun to share the gospel in Spanish. It's part of my gospel language is Spanish, and I love it. Oftentimes I'll pray in Spanish, and it helps me focus. It's very intimate. But my mission was so unique. My grandpa, as I left on my mission, Grandpa Driggs, he gave me the best advice. He said, Spence, be yourself and have fun. He was obviously a very fun person, but it's like he freed me not to be a robot. He freed me to say, you know what? Heavenly Father has given me unique gifts, and that's why he's called me at this particular time in this particular place. And so he doesn't want me to be a robot. He, anybody can be a robot, but nobody can be Spence Taggart. I'm different. I'm unique, and my grandpa let me be that. And so I was able to have so much fun and be myself on my mission and really, really cement my testimony of not only of, of my Savior, of Jesus Christ, of the Holy Ghost, and the restored gospel that Joseph Smith brought back and the fullness of the gospel. But also it helped me solidify my testimony of myself, of who I am, of who I am as a son of God and who he wants me to become. I learned how to pray, and that's one of the stories uh, that, that I'd love you to see at the end of my life. -y. And I learned that miracles are real. I learned that if we allow ourselves to be instrument in God's hands, he can do incredible things with us. And I'm grateful for my mission. After my mission to Guatemala, my life has been full of lessons, has been full of opportunities to strengthen my testimony and continue my life's mission, not only in teaching the gospel, but in temple work, in family history, in my own family, in teaching others and inspiring others. Life is a mission. and. After my, one of my favorite callings in the church was after my mission when Katie and I were married in California. I got, I got to be an early morning seminary teacher, and that was where I realized how much I really loved teaching and how, how lucky that I got to teach seminary. And I got to teach the two funnest books. I got to teach the Doctrine and Covenants, and I got to teach the Book of Mormon. And so it was so fun. I mean, I love the New Testament. At the time, they were my two favorite. But since then, I've had several different callings and different opportunities to serve and speak and sing and share my testimony to literally tens of thousands and on social media, millions of people. And I'm grateful for that. Uh, I do think that because life is a mission, life is a journey, and we're constantly able to grow our testimony, I would say the greatest, the greatest character 
that we need to develop in order to build and grow our testimony is humility. The minute that we realize that there is room to grow, that we haven't made it, that just because we were able to accomplish this or because we are able to have this experience or understand this principle we think we understand, doesn't mean it's over. If we're humble enough to recognize that there is so much room for growth, we will grow. And once we recognize that the challenges and the trials that Heavenly Father blesses us with are opportunities for us to grow and strengthen our testimony, it is lights out amazing. And over the last, over my life, you know, I was born of very goodly parents. I had the scriptures as a part of my life from a very young age. We read scriptures of family. You know, we've been on a family mission. I went on a mission to Guatemala. I married to a spiritual rock star. And I have very intentionally focused on building my relationship with Heavenly Father. But the last four years, while being able to work for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and, and have that be, not only have that be my focus in my career, but also in... Uh, kind of in my life, it's been amazing. And so I invite everyone to dig deep into the scriptures, to dig deep into what our current prophets and apostles teach us and the leaders of the church, to dig deep into your soul to understand who you are and where you came from and what are the gifts and experiences that Heavenly Father wants you to have. I invite you to dig deep into prayer so that you might get to know your Savior, that you might get to know your Heavenly Father, and you might get to know the gift, which is the gift of the Holy Ghost, that can teach you all truth and help you understand who you are, where you came from, why you're here, and where you're going. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.